just by way of context, let me give you a little background on Paul's letter to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians is actually a corrective text. So what Paul is doing is the church had sent him a list of questions, things that were going on within the body of believers. And Paul's response is actually written in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. And in, specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, Paul is uh, addressing the church on their use of spiritual gifts. Now they had been, begun to misuse spiritual gifts and puffing themselves up and edifying themselves instead of using the spiritual gift as a sign to the unbeliever and also as a, to edify the body of Christ. And so if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 20, uh, 31, the very last uh, verse in chapter 12, it says this, But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. I'm also reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Uh, and I just want you to know that. But Paul is saying, I, I want to show you a more excellent way. And he leads right into, unfortunately, we break, the, humans have broke the scripture up in a way that God never intended it for it to be broken up. So if you pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 without understanding what was written in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you're going to miss exactly the intentions of the writer and ultimately the intentions of the Holy Spirit. And so what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is doing is going to show us a more excellent way, and that more excellent way is the agape love of God. If there is ever anything that we needed on planet Earth again, it's a fresh manifestation of God's agape love. We need a manifestation. I tell you, the church needs a manifestation of the agape love of God. And so that's what Paul is going to write to the church here. Let me show you a more excellent way. So let's begin our reading in verse number 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. The Bible says this, Love is patient and love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It, it does not insist on having its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Anybody feel like you need to pray yet? I, I have to be honest with you. This was one of the most convicting sermons in my preparation time that I've had in years. The word of God, the Bible says, is sharper than a two-edged sword. God's word has the ability to cut us going in and cut us coming out. And, and God just, the word of God is a mirror and it just speaks to us volumes. Look at verse number 6. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Notice verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. Love endures all things. The first three words of number 8 is love never ends. This morning with God's help I'd like to preach on the thought love that is lasting. The love that is lasting. Let us bow for prayer. Father we love you this morning. God we're so thankful to be assembled together with like minded believers. Lord thank you Father for that you love us. Lord that your love never fails. Lord that you are so in love with us. God that you sent your only son to die for us on Calvary. God there is no greater expression of love throughout history than that God would die for man on a cruel, rugged cross. And so, Lord, we're so thankful uh, to be recipients of your love this morning. And God, I pray that you would help us to see your agape love. And God, that you would help us to be filled with that love. And Lord, that you would uh, pour out your love upon us so that you can extend your love through us this morning. And so, Lord, as we begin to identify the important relationships in our life, as we begin to think about the marital relationship, God, as we begin to think about the parental and the, uh, the, the relationship with friends and, and with church family and with coworkers and with uh, fellow students and uh, so many different relationships, God, that we would take a close look, that we would examine ourselves and examine our hearts this morning on this Valentine's Day to see the love that lasts is the agape love of God. Lord, do what only you can do in this place. 
Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's done. In Jesus' name, everybody said, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. A man and his friend were playing golf one day, and one of the guys was getting ready to make a chip shot. And as he prepared to stroke the ball on the green, he saw a long funeral procession on the road next to the golf course. The man took off his golf cap, he got on his knees, and he bowed his head to pray. His friend said, wow, that is the most touching and most thoughtful thing that I've ever seen from you. I, I just can't believe how great it was for you to stop your golf swing for a pu funeral procession. It was passing by. My, what thoughtfulness that was. The man replied, yeah, well, we were married for 35 years. I figured that's the least that I could do. Help me, somebody. How many know that's not the love that God's talking about? No, that wasn't Russ Emmerine, Hazel. Hazel's over here shouting because she thinks that was her husband, Russ. How many would agree with the preacher this morning that we live in a society that is enamored and infatuated by the word love? Today, February the 14th, 2016, is a day that our society celebrates as Valentine's Day. It's the love holiday. And it's on this day that more flowers and more jewelry and box chocolates are bought and sold more than any other day on the calendar. But can I remind you this morning that love is so much more than flowers and jewelry and box chocolates. Help me. Amen. See, if you attend, or if you stop by Dylan's today, you'll see all of the bouquet of flowers. And men, it's a great time to, to buy your wife some flowers. And, and one of the great things about flowers is how good they smell. The fresh aroma. Amen. But can I remind you. That a flower one day a year. And the fresh aroma of that flower doesn't mean anything. If your attitude stinks all year long. That flower doesn't smell very good. If your attitude stinks all year long. Help the preacher out this morning. Amen. And how about box chocolates? I know that some of you bought your sweetheart a box of chocolates. And how many know that these are pretty sweet? Amen. But the reality is, is if you've treated your uh, spouse really sour throughout the year, these box chocolates aren't going to be very sweet to the taste buds. Help me, somebody. The jewelry that is bought on Valentine's Day is unbelievable. And a piece of jewelry is to be a token that every time that you look down at that piece of jewelry, it's a token of remembrance. This was bought on such and such day for this reason. But how many know that if you go to the jewelry store and you have so much thought put into this one piece of jewelry and you get down on one knee and it's like you're reliving the wedding day all over again you get down on one knee and you present this on Valentine's Day to your spouse but every day throughout the year that you get off work if you go to the garage and pay your spouse no attention how many know that doesn't mean much what are, you, what are you trying to say, preacher? Love is more than gifts. Love is more. And, and our society is infatuated. And, and once again, that, that there's so much uh, money that is spent on this day. And, and, and I don't believe that's really what spouses are looking for. They're looking for something that is more. They're looking for genuine love. They're looking for the agape love. And you say, preacher, if that's not love, well, what is love? Well, the Bible says... In 1 John 4 and 8, that God is love. God is love. Notice this. If you're a note taker this morning, understand this morning that love is not something that God does. Love is who he is. The Bible says that God is love. It's not his action. It's his character. 
Love is not something that God does. Love is who God is. The Bible says that God is love. It is the nature and the character. It is who that God is. And there are so many counterfeits of this love in our society. Uh, uh, But the source of all true love is Almighty God. One of those counterfeits that our society is confused between love is lust. Love is not some warm, gushy feeling that you get inside when you're attracted to someone. That's lust. Love is not some sexual sen- sensation that you feel once in a while when you're stimulated. Listen, that's lust. Love is so much more than that. The Bible teaches us that love is an action, that love is an act of the will. It's a, Love is an ongoing choice that you make, that I love this person not because of who they are, but in spite of who they are. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to look to the Word of God, and I, I want to look into God's Word and see what He says about love. We'll be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. And so three things that I want you to notate. I want you to look right from the Word of God this morning. Number one, I want you to not- notate what love is. The second thing I want you to notate is what love is not. And then the last thing I want you to notate is what love does. It's interesting In describing what love does, Paul uses two verbs. In describing, or I'm I'm sorry, in describing what love is, Paul uses two verbs. In describing what love is not, Paul uses seven verbs. And then describing what love does, he describes four verbs. So let's let's take a look at this. We're going to move quick through the word of God this morning. The first thing I want you to notice is what love is. This is the positive description in the word of God. Paul begins with two verbs which describe what love is. Notice what it says, verse number four. What's it say? Love is what? Love is patient and what? Love is... These are not so much descriptions of what love is, but rather on on how love acts. I think a better translation uh, of the word of God might be this, that love acts patiently and love acts kindly. And so the first thing that that Paul says in this positive description is that love is patient. Isn't it interesting that the very first description for love that is used in the word of God here is that is patience? And so what is patience? I know you're you're always taught don't pray for patience because if you pray for patience you're going to get stuck at a train when you got to be somewhere in five minutes and that train's going to last ten. God will test your patience if you pray for it. So what is, uh, according to the word of God, what exactly is patience? Well, the, the Greek word here means to bear patiently with other people's faults and offenses to be long-suffering. To bear patiently with other people's faults and their offenses and to be long-suffering. Would anybody agree that God is the source of all love? God is love. And would anybody agree with the preacher this morning that God is long-suffering to us? And the question is, I want to ask you this morning, how much do you really love those that are close to you? How much do you really love your spouse? How much do you really love your children? How much do you really love your coworkers and your church family? Because the reality is, if you really love them, are you long-suffering with them? Do you really bear patiently with their faults? And their offenses. Everybody look right up here. How many know we all have faults and offenses? How many would agree with the preacher that there is no such thing as a perfect marriage? There is no such thing as a perfect wife. There is no such thing as a perfect husband. But ask my wife. I come pretty close. Amen. I thought I'd get one amen, but I didn't. But to be long-suffering... That means to bear, to put up with. There are times, listen, that I might act like a knucklehead. But guess what? When my wife is full of the agape love of God, guess what she does? She is long-suffering with me. And she's understanding. And she's compassionate through those times. She doesn't take a hike and, and get out of town when I'm acting that way. Why? Because she's filled with the agape love of God. Love is patient. It bears patiently with one another's faults and offenses. To be long-suffering. How many know that your children are wonderful at the newborn stage? How many know they'll test and try you in the terrible twos? But how many know 
that you'll lose your hair when they become teenagers. Amen. Bushman, I think he's lost a few through my teenage years. Amen. But how many know, better look right up here. How many know when your children make mistakes that love is patient with them? In the same way that God is patient with you, in the same way that God is long-suffering with you, we should extend that same long-suffering to our spouse. We should extend that same long-suffering to our children if we're really going to operate in the agape love of God. Somebody say amen. amen. The second thing that Paul, in his positive description, he says that love is kind. God is kind. And so as his children, we should be like God and we should be kind. The Greek word here for kind is to be useful, to be serving, and to be gracious. How many know it's an oxymoron to call yourself a Christian and to act any other way than kind? How many know that Christians ought to be the most kind people on planet earth? One church I, I read in, in my research uh, uh, this week that one church structured their evangelism program off of a book entitled The Conspiracy of Kindness. And, and in their evangelistic program, the people of the church, they met monthly and they went into the community with one goal and that was to show the kindness and the love of Jesus Christ. And they offered to mow lawns and to clean yards and to trim trees and to change oils and cars. And then what they would do is they would leave them with, with a, a, a card with their church name and address on it and go their way. And it was amazing how God began to use that ministry and how God began to grow that church. Why? Because the community was attracted to the kindness. How many know that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care? You can, listen, you can be theologically correct, but if you don't operate in kindness, nobody cares about your theology. You can be biblically accurate, and you can memorize the word of God, and you can be correct in your understanding and interpretation of the word of God, but understand this morning that you've got to have kindness to go along with that. And the real first test of, uh, of Christian kindness, guess where it begins? Not in the church house, not at work or not at the school, guess where it begins? At home. And so the real question is, are you kind to those in your home? Because it's a shame when you treat people at Walmart better, better than you do you're in your own home. There are some spouses that would give anything for their spouse to treat them as good as they do others in public that they don't even know. I remember sitting across one time in, in the height of my jail ministry, uh, across from this young man, he, he, he found himself locked up at Sedgwick County Jail, and he told me, Preacher, I don't know how I got here. He says, but one of the things I, I want you to know is that as a kid, I memorized 67 verses of the King James Version of the Bible. I, I was raised in church, and my dad was a deacon, but here's what I want you to understand. My house was a war zone. My house was a war zone. I memorized the Word of God. But I never experienced kindness in my home. But at the church, my, my parents were the most kind-hearted people that I've ever met. But inside of my home, it was a war zone. How many know our children are watching us close? Well, I better move on. i got to move quickly today. Somebody say amen. But God, love acts kindly. Love acts patiently. And so Paul, he, in his description of love, in his positive description, he says that love is patient. And love is kind. If you believe it, say amen. The second thing, which will take a little longer to get through, is what love is not if you're a note taker. This is the negative description of love. Once again, Paul gives two positive descriptions and then seven negative descriptions of what love is not. And notice what the, the word of God says. That love does not envy or love, if you have the authorized version is, the version, is that love is not jealous. Here's the thing. Love and jealousy are mutually exclusive. You can't have one and have the other at the same time. Jealousy has two forms. One form of jealousy is this. I want what someone else has. Also known as coveting. But then there's another that that's basically, I want what someone else has. This is rooted in selfishness. But then the other form of jealousy 
is this. I wish that person didn't have what they have. How many know that's a little worse than selfishness? That's based in evilness. I wish that I had what that person has. And then the other form of jealousy is that I wish that person didn't have what they have. Everybody look right up here. Jealousy is not from God. And here's what you need to understand. When God blesses you and when God anoints you and when God prospers you, not everybody's going to be happy about it. And everybody look right up here. And sometimes even church people aren't going to be happy about it. But I want you to understand, when God blesses someone else, we ought to be excited about God blessing them. We ought to be thankful. And, and, and listen, just because we, not, we may not be able to experience the same blessing that God's blessing out on them, guess what? God is doing that for them, and we ought to rejoice, and we ought to celebrate, and we ought to be thankful, because if not, we're jealous towards them. Amen. And love is not jealous. What if it's just a test? What if God wants to pour out the same blessing on you but he first wants to see how you'll react to somebody else's blessing. Man, I've seen this in church. I've seen this happen in church where, where you, you've got seasoned saints of God that have been praying for their children to be saved and, 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 and to get born again. Then you've got a new convert that comes in. And, and, and man, they haven't served the Lord a week. And they come in they say, pray for my kids to be saved. Next thing you know, their kids are saved. You know what? You know where the temptation comes in to get jealous? Why would God do that for them but not do that for me that's been serving God? For, hey, what if it's just a test? What if God's testing the motives of your heart? Listen, the Bible says that love is not jealous, that we should be rejoicing and we should be excited when God blesses someone else. But not everyone will be excited when God blesses you. If you believe it, say amen. Not only does love is, is love not jealous, but notice what it also says. It does not boast. It's not braggadocious. Amen. See, bragging is trying to make others jealous of what you have. See, jealousy puts others down, but bragging builds yourself up. It's pointing the attention to yourself. See, bragging, jealousy is, is, is one thing, but bragging is rooted in pride because it's the attempt to make other people jealous of what God's given you. Here's the thing that I've learned in the Christian arena. You're always okay when you brag on Jesus. But when you brag on yourself, you're in trouble. Why? Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And here's what we need to understand. We have no rhyme or reason to be braggadocious. There is no place for bragging in the kingdom of God because what we have, we have it simply by the grace of God. It's not because that I'm so good. It's not because I'm so smart. It's not because that I'm a, a superior to anybody else. What, the reason why I have what I have is simply by the grace of God. I can't brag of I'm like the Apostle Paul. God forbid that I should boast of anything except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that I have, every bit of prosperity in my life simply comes because of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bragging. Love does not boast. Love does not brag. If you believe it, say amen. And then the scripture goes on to say, notice, that it is not arrogant. Arrogance is the attitude of superiority that makes us think somehow that we are better than someone else. Everybody look right up here. Even as believers, we're not better than anybody else in society. How many know the ground's level at the foot of the cross? And we are what we are by the grace of God. Like Paul said, if anybody could have considered himself superior, pinning down 13 books in the New Testament... Paul could have considered himself superior to other believers, but he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Love is not arrogant. There is no idea of superiority, and it doesn't matter what your economic status is. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter what your educational background is. Understand this morning that you're no better than anybody else, that you are not superior to anybody else. The Bible teaches us the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all God's children. Amen? And love is not arrogant. Here's the thing. Love doesn't look down on others. Love doesn't stick your nose in the air. Amen? Boy, I've met some Christians, I've met some preachers like that. 
had a meeting this week. Somebody needed to meet with me, and man, they were nervous about the meeting. You know what I told them after the meeting? I says, I said, I want you to understand as a pastor, I want to be approachable. I'm not patting myself on the back, but here's the thing. I've met some arrogant preachers, and I don't want to be one of those. I don't want to be somebody that embarrasses people. They have a question. Listen, there is no such thing as a dumb question in the kingdom of God, specifically as new converts. Listen, if you've got a question, find somebody and ask the question because guess what? God has some answers for your questions. But love is not arrogant. It, it, you, we all should be approachable as, as pe- the people of God. Amen? Because we're no better than anybody else. We should be down to earth and we should be humble. Love. Is not arrogant. It's the superiority. The attitude of superiority is that of the Pharisees and the scribes, amen, and the Sadducees, that they considered themselves elite in the kingdom of God. By, by the way, let me just say this, that our denomination is not elite in the kingdom of God. Free will Baptist is not the only way to heaven. The blood of Jesus is the only way to heaven. And so when we get this idea that we are superior, when we get this idea that we've got it all right, now listen to me, you can go the hard way if you want. I just decide I'm going to go the easy way and go the free will Baptist way. Some of you get that on your way home. I'm kidding. Amen. But this elitism in the kingdom of God, there's no place for it. Amen. And this idea that that we look down on churches because they're smaller or we look up to uh, churches because they're bigger, understand love is not arrogant. If you believe it, say amen. Amen. Proverbs 8, 13, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. Arrogance is something that God hates. Notice what the scripture goes on to say, the fourth negative description of love. Notice what it says is that love is not rude. Amen. Love is not rude. The principle here has to do with poor manners and acting rudely. While this is not such a serious fault as bragging or arrogance, understand it still stems from the same lovelessness. It is a, basically what Paul is saying here is this is a failure to act politely. By the way, parents, I think it would do you some good to teach your children to act politely once again. Amen. Well, I'm telling you, I I, I find this serious, serious in our society. There is such a lack, lack of politeness in children anymore. It's a disgrace. It really is. uh, uh, When we go out to dinner, when my children say please and thank you, it's almost like the the waitress are surprised that that kids even do that anymore. And and there's a book that I I would encourage every parent to, to look into, and it's called Uncommon Courtesy for Kids. And and what this does is it it teaches you how to disciple your kids in just common courtesy. Things like this, how to make an apology. How many know we need to teach our kids how to make apologies? Everybody look right up here. And even when young Johnny is two years old, he has a sinful nature and he doesn't want to apologize. I see this all the time in my house. Bella, go apologize to your brother Isaiah. She doesn't want to do it. What is it? It's the sinful nature. It's not that she's a bad kid. Guess what? It happens in adults too. Old Johnny and Sue had a tiff. Go apologize. I don't want to do that. But in, in this uncommon courtesy for kids, how to make an apology, courtesy for others, respecting your elders. Amen. Answering the phone. How to behave in the house of God. How many know this isn't your home? How many know this isn't a gymnasium? This is the house of God. The uncommon courtesy. And here's what you have to understand. As you take a look at the United States of America, what you'll begin to see is that good manners are becoming less and less common as we take a good look at it. And here's what we see from the word of God is that love acts politely. We need to teach our children how to love and to be filled with the agape love of God listen it shouldn't be pulling teeth for our children to hold the door open for somebody that needs to walk through the door amen love acts politely and then the fifth thing I want you to see notice what it says is that love does not insist on having its own way amen see the root of of all fall human nature is wanting to have its own way. I like what the Bible commentator R.C.H. Linsky said. He said, if you cure selfishness, 
and you will have just replanted the Garden of Eden. Think about it. If you cure selfishness, you will have just replanted the Garden of Eden. Here's what we see in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve rejected God's way. They wanted their own way. Every conflict in life can come back to this right here. Is that man wants to insist on having his own way. All my marriage counseling, it comes back to this. You've got a husband and you've got a wife. They too both want to have their own way. Listen, at some point we have to decide we want God's way. We're going to humble ourselves and we're going to prefer. And, and so this is the selfishness. And this is what the Bible says is that love does not insist on having its own way. Listen, lo what love does is it prefers your spouse above yourself. Boy, I told you this was going to be convicting. God just really convicted me through this message. Are you always insisting on having your way? Listen, this is where you can have it your way. Marriage doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. You can't insist on always having your own way and having a healthy relationship. There are times that you have to humble yourself and say, you know what? I'm going to prefer, I'm, I'm going I'm to bite the bullet on this one. I'm going to prefer my spouse above myself. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to zip my lip and I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to insist on having my own way all the time. Why? Because the Bible says love doesn't do that. Love does not insist on having its own way. Then the sixth thing that we see, notice this, is that love is not irritable or resentful. Love is not irritable. The Greek word here means to arouse in anger. See, love guards against being irritated or upset or, or uh, angered by things that are done or set against it. Here's the thing I want to ask you. A true test of your love is how do you react when things don't go your way? Do you react emotionally? Do you, are you aroused to anger? And the Bible says that love is not irritable. I want to ask you, wives, have you been irritable lately? Husbands? Husbands been irritable? Amen. Here's what we see. Love's not behind that. I want you to notice this. What love is and what love isn't. This is why we need a fresh manifestation of God's love again. In our hearts and lives. If we really want to experience Valentine's, we've got to go beyond the flowers. We've got to get beyond the chocolates. We've got to get beyond the jewelry. And we've got to get back to the word of God. This is what love is. Amen. And love is not irritable. And the, and, and the question is, are you patient and are you kind? Or are you irritable and aroused in anger? This word, this Greek word, it stems from a word which is a convulsion of sudden outburst or emotion of anger. How many know that that's not love? Amen. And then number seven, notice this, that love does not keep a record of wrongdoing. Love does not keep a record of wrongdoing. The Greek word is a bookkeeping term here, and it means to calculate or to reckon as when figuring an entry in a ledger. It's an accounting term. And so what you do in accounting is that you make a ledger so that you can go back at future, you, uh, uh, future times and you can look back on that. And so you are keeping a permanent record of a ledger, okay? That's accounting. That's good business practice so that you make the ledger and you can go back to this at any time if there's an audit or whatever else that you can go back and you can explain that purchase. In a, in a practical sense, here's what God is saying. Love doesn't do that. Love does not keep a record of wrongdoing. See, love is not historical. See, love doesn't bring up the past and present arguments. Because love keeps no record of wrong. One person says, well, love forget, uh, forgets and forgives. No, more than that, love remembers and still forgives. See, this idea of forgetting and forgiving is, is really not even scriptural. 
It's not biblical because the reality is, is you don't have the ability just to forget things on your own. Now, if God takes it from your memory, that's wonderful. But the conscience and the mind that God gave you, guess what? God gave you a memory for a reason. There are a lot of things in this life that you need to remember. God wants you to remember his faithfulness. God wants you to remember the times that he pulled through on you. And guess what? That even goes on the bad times. There are going to be some things that happen in life that you would love to be able to forget, but you can't. But here's the amazing thing about love. Even though you can't forget and forgive, you can still remember and still forgive. That's love. That is the agape love of God. That God understands what you've done. He hasn't forgotten it from his mind, but he still chooses to forgive you. And that is biblical sense of love. In your relationship with your spouse, in your relationship with your children, in your relationship with your extended family, with your coworkers, with your church family, you understand the fault, you understand the wrongdoing, you remember it, but you still forgive them anyway. Boy, that's good. God doesn't, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. This one woman came to the pastor and says, Pastor, I need you to pray. She says, every time we get in an argument, my wife gets historical. And the pastor says, you mean hysterical? And she says, no. Uh, the pastor says, I, historical. She brings up this and that from the past and, and everything else that I've ever done. How many know that spouses have good memories? Amen? But we shouldn't be dwelling on those things. We should remember them and choose to forgive. I like pre peacemaker ministries and their four promises of forgiveness. Th this is the four promises of forgiveness from peacemaker ministries. Number one, I will not dwell on this incident. How do I do us some good if we stop dwelling on the things that are done in the past? Number two, I will not bring up this incident again and use it against you. Why? Because love remembers and still forgives. Number three, I will not talk to others about this incident. These are good promises of forgiveness right here. And then I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. How is that possible through the agape love of God? Why? Because guess what? Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It's good. You want a better marriage? Get a hold of this. You want a better relationship with your children and, and, and just better relationships in general? You've got to get a hold of this. Love does not. Keep a record of wrongs. If you believe it, say amen. amen. And then Paul goes in to what love does. Four things. And I'm done. Love bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. And endures all things. Love never fails. See, the counterfeit of agape love fails all the time. We see it. That's why we have a broken society. Is because somebody has said, I love you, but it was counterfeit. Because love never fails. According to the word of God. Now, I'm not making this up. This isn't my interpretation of the word of God. This is what God's word says. Love never fails. So what does, what does love do? Well, the first thing the Bible says that love bears all things. This Greek word here means to cover, support, and to ultimately protect. Are you supporting those that you love? Have you made a covering over their life through prayer? And a covering over their life uh, uh, through the, the support that you need to give them? Do you cover, support, and protect those that you claim to love? Because that's what bears. You know, you know what it is. You've got a, a, a weight-bearing wall. What you have is, is you've got some support beams there that are supporting the weight of the wall, okay? That's the same thing, is that love comes behind when times get tough. And when things are tough on my brother, you know what? When Donnie feels like he's falling down, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to bear him. I'm going to support him. I'm going to cover him, and I'm going to be there for him so he doesn't fall. That's what the Bible says here, is that there, you're a, think about this, you're a support beam. You've got one, two, three, four support beams right here. You take these support beams out, this sanctuary collapses right now. It's done. Are you a support beam for those that you claim to love? Are you a source of support for them? Because that's what the Bible is teaching here, is that love bears all things. Even through the difficult times, love is the support beam. And then the Bible says that love believes all things. Love is not suspicious or cynical. Love gives others the benefit of the doubt. Love's not always questioning others' motives. 
I wonder if you're always questioning the motives of your spouse, always questioning the motives of others, or do you give them the benefit of the doubt? Amen? See, love is not cynical in that regard. Love believes all things. Love does not judge the motives of others. By the way, if you're going to err, I've decided this for myself, and I would encourage you to do the same. If you're going to err in this life of Christianity, I would encourage you to err on the side of grace than on the side of legalism. Because the reality is, is that you don't want to stand before God one day and say that you were just too hard on people. But if I stand before God one day and he says, you know what, you, were just a li- you just showed that person a little too much grace. You know what I'm going to say is, God, I was just trying to be like you. Just trying to be like you because you've extended to me so much grace. Love believes all things. And then the third thing is that love hopes. Hope understands God's grace and, and love and that failure is never final. Aren't you thankful that God never took Israel's failure as final? Aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't take Peter's failure as final? And understand this morning that hope understands that your failures in life are not final. Hey, you're going to fall down and mess up in marriage, but guess what? Hope goes on even through the failures of life. You're not going to give up and you're not going to say this failure is final. No. Why? Because hope believes in the future. Hope believes in the future. You say the present isn't looking very good, but you know what? Hope looks to the future. Things may not be very good right now, but guess what? They're going to get better. Why? Because love hopes. There's hope in love. If you believe it, say amen. And last but not least, love endures all things. Think about that. Love endures somebody say all things with me why do we make some things exclusive why do we exclude things from the text that aren't really there why do we decide in our mind that love endures all things except for this or except for this or except for this When the word of God says that love, the agape love of God, it endures all things. This is a a, a military term used of an army's holding a vital position at all costs. That no matter what is the enemy is doing, it doesn't matter the front that the enemy is bringing, that here you have the picture, a soldier that is guarding, is, is there at the position and guarding it at all costs. No matter what comes our way, I will not be moved. No matter the hardship, no matter the suffering, no matter the difficulties that we're faced with, love endures all things. And this love, unfortunately, verse number 7 ends right there. So you have to go to verse number 8. But this love that I've just described to you, what love is, what love is not, and what love does, this love never fails how do you get this love God's the source of all love how do you know that the Bible says that God is love notice God it's not something that God does it's who God is we need a fresh manifestation of the agape love of God how do we get it we run to God's arms this morning you say preacher I've been doing a terrible terrible job of lining up to the word of God this morning with those in the relationships that I love with my spouse, with my children, with my family, extended family members, even my enemies. Preacher, I have not been showing the agape love of God. I tell you, you say, preacher, I've lost it. Well, how do you find it? You run back to God. You run back to God because he is the source of it all. And the reality is this love will never fail. The counterfeit, we see a broken society because... We call a lot of things love that are not love. And we live in a broken society under the banner of love. But the reality is God's love will never fail. Amen? Let's bow for prayer.